a little ditty about Jack and Dave. Oh. All right, everybody, this time we got 1971's Hands of the River. But before we go any further, you know the routine to the trailer. Let's go. Between the 2nd of April, 1888, and September the 17th, 1889, a dreadful fear descended over the streets of London. No one who saw that face lived, except one small child whom he spared because she was his own flesh and blood. There was another murder. They're looking for Jack the Ripper. It's you. The records tell us that the Ripper killed nine times. The curse lived on into a second generation of terror. Damn it, Pritchard, you've got a possessed being in your home, as savage as any wild beast. These are the streets. And these are the women. And this is the girl who inherited the hands that Jack used. Okay, this movie was directed by Peter Sazdy. Peter Sazdy had a long career. He directed movies like Countess Dracula, uh, Nothing But the Night, the Lonely Lady, Welcome to Blood City, Journey to the Unknown. He had a long, long career. He's still alive today, even though he's well into his 80s. And he directed a ton of TV series and shows over there in Merry Old Land of England. So, great career, long, uh, long life, all a success. God bless. All right, let's get to the cast. Okay, playing Dr. Pritchard was Eric Porter. He was in a lot of movies from uh, things like Day of the Jackal, Anthony and Cleopatra. And he also did a lot of TV work over in the wonderful land of England once again. Watch this motion picture. He strangely reminds me of like Roy Scheider of from like when he was in that movie All That Jazz, you know what I'm talking about, where he played the uh, Bob Fosse character or whatever you want to call it. And if you look at him with the beard and the hair and everything like that, you're like, holy shit, he looks just like Roy Scheider. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe it's me. He just reminds me of Roy Scheider. I, I don't know. Okay, I'm going to butcher this name. I know I'm going to do it. But playing Anna was Angahad Mar Reese. She was in a lot of motion pictures back in the day. She was in uh, tons of TV shows. So that goes without question. We know that. But she'd be on being in Hands of the Ripper. She was also in things like Anyone for Sex, Catch Me a Spy. Under Milk Wood. She was in the, uh, the the Jane Eyre TV movie series. I mean, this is even before she did Hands of the Ripper. I mean, this is way, way, way back. But she went on to do other things. She was in stuff like uh, The Duchess of Duke Street, The Curse of King Tut's Tomb. She was just in a, she was in a bunch of stuff. You know what I mean? And then she actually did some jewelry design work and things like that. And her career kind of petered out. She had a kind of a semi tragic life. She died relatively young in her in her sixties, if memory serves. Her son was killed in a car accident when he was young, and it wouldn't say it was the best ride for her, but, you know, she made a little mark in movies, and God bless her, and, you know, rest in peace. Okay, now, talking about a long career, Jane Marrow's career, who plays Laura in this motion picture, probably goes by far longer and deeper than anybody else in this whole motion picture. I mean, she was in a massive amount of TV credits in America, too. You know, she was in the United States and Europe. She was all over the place. She had a slew of movies she was in. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a little bit of the list. Here we go. She was in The Phantom of the Opera, Man of the World, The Birth of a Private Man, The Human Jungle, Love Story, Detective. She was in a, a, a massive amount of stuff. And then she was in stuff over here uh, that you'd be more, if you're, if you're, from the U.S. that you remember. Sorry, I don't mean to discredit the rest of the world. I don't mean it like that. But uh, she was on stuff like The Incredible Hulk and The Six Million Dollar Man. And uh, what else was she in? I think she was even in an episode of Magnum P.I., if memory serves. But she's still alive today, still going strong, still popping up in things. So, you know, Jane Merrill, rock and roll, man. That's a career. Okay, playing Pritchard's son, Michael, is Keith Bell. He was on a, a massive amount of TV shows back in the day, a bunch of TV series. He was on stuff like... UFO, he was on Boy Meets Girl, The Borders, The Possessed, No Hiding Place, Secret Agent. 
I, I don't think he went on to have any kind of a real meaningful movie career, but he did get a lot of work back in the day, and, you know, sometimes when you see his face, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I've never seen that guy pop up in a couple areas, but did a good job in this motion picture, so let's keep going. Okay, playing Dysart was uh, Derek Godfrey. Derek Godfrey died in his 50s, so his career never went on to be extremely long or extremely, like, uh, I wouldn't hate to say he's extremely successful because he had a good run. And he had one of those faces where if you watched a lot of the TV or stuff of that era from overseas, you'd be like, oh, I've seen that face before, but you didn't know where you seen him before. You knew he wasn't a big name, but you knew he had been around. He was in, he was in a, lot of, a bunch of TV shows, and he was in A Midsummer Night's Dream, The Abominable Mr. Fibs. He was on The Avengers. He was, he was in a... a a thing, uh, this thing called Warship, you know, so he, he had got some work and he had been around, again, died relatively young, so, but he does a really, really good job as playing this kind of like, you know, pompous, self-serving kind of a human being, but, it, well, I shouldn't say that, the character, nah, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, whatever, all right. Okay, Mara, this movie starts out, and the first thing you see is the sign that says White Chapel on it, and you know who we're talking about. You see these bunch of people with torches chasing this guy down the street, and then this guy, of course, when he's trying to run away from all these people, where does he run? He runs home. And he runs to his wife and his child. And we find out that this man is none other than Jack the Ripper himself. He goes home. His wife says, why do you got blood on your hands? Why are these people out there looking for... My God, you're Jack the Ripper. And of course, what does this guy do? He kills his wife right in front of their infant daughter, Anna. That's the beginning of the movie. That gives us our launching point. You jump forward. Now Anna is living with this hokey, smoky, jokey, complete con artist of a fortune teller. And she keeps Anna there, who is now like in her later teens, and she keeps sort of fool people about their psychic readings. Anna is the voice from beyond communicating with the dead, just speaking through a, a basically a vent in the wall. And she uses her to con people out of cash and to con people out of money. Sadly and disgustingly, she also uses this girl as for prostitution. She pays these, you know, she lets these uh, well-to-do Englishmen pay to have sex with her upstairs in the room. Now here's where this movie goes a little bit crazy. Anna is severely scarred by the death of her mother at the hands of her father. Nobody else really knows where she came from, so they don't know the baggage she's carrying. But when a certain twinkle from a certain kind of light reflecting off any kind of jewelry hits her in the eyes and then god forbid anybody plants a kiss on her it sends her back into that evening and back into that night to, and she goes on to commit the same murderous atrocities as her very own father so basically now you have this daughter who innocently without wanting to be a murderer without wanting to be a killer without really having a malicious side to her when she into this trance she just goes on these killing sprees until she gets whatever's going on out of her system that person is dead and then she wakes up and she's like what happened what ha I huh that's the gist of this motion picture i'm going to give you some more of this motion picture though uh one of the men that was going to pay to have sex with her one night is a very well-to-do a very established fine english gentleman and he sees her murder this fortune teller goon pimp madam one night and he sees this happen and he runs out there's a witness this guy this guy uh, this dr pritchard who's a psychiatrist sees him leaving and he knows this man they're they're semi friends if you will but he when the inquest comes he covers for him even though it would look like this man did it. It would, it would blatantly implicate him. It would blatantly put him on the scene of the crime. And everybody would think he would do it, because God knows nobody's going to blame this little teenage innocent young girl. Pritchard comes to his rescue. Pritchard says, ah, oh, Dysart, yes, seen him. he had nothing to do with this. He wasn't around, blah, 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 even though he was in the room when it happened. And Dysart can't understand why he's covering for this girl. He explains to him this girl's a murderer, but the thing is Pritchard knows she's a murderer. He's banking on her being a murderer because he wants to study what it is that makes people murder other people. He wants to get into the psychological aspect of what creates a killer, what creates a criminal, what creates a monster to hide behind the closed eyes of a normal looking young lady. So, as he's doing more work, 
she has more episodes where she kills and he hides for her or he hides her or he covers for her, and she kills again and he covers for her. and you're left to the point of how far is this going to go on when is this going to end and how is the story going to end up is it worth it to this doctor to keep on letting everybody around die just so he can keep studying this girl who sooner or later is he going to realize he can't control the beast he can't reason with it and it's past her control the gist of the story okay what makes this motion picture work is it's an actually fairly well written well directed motion picture all the actors do a good job in it it's got kind of a hokey premise yeah i mean come on let's be honest let's not kid each other i mean you know the girl gets some light in her eyes and somebody gives her a kiss on the cheek and before you know her, she freaks out and starts killing people but if you can roll with that premise it's actually an interesting little psychological trip that they go on it's not a masterpiece it's not one of the greatest motion pictures ever made but it's definitely entertaining and, and well done for its time there's some interesting uh, special effects like mate shots in it that you can kind of spot when you're looking at it where they they make like the cathedral look bigger and they, they, they kind of do some stuff where you're like wow look what they were doing back then in 71 you know what I mean this is kind of cool that they for a for a movie like this you know this isn't the birds or or some Hitchcock flick with a grant for this they really put some effort in they really did an excellent excellent job the movie's fun it's entertaining uh, you're waiting to see how it turns out in the end you're you're hoping that certain people don't die I mean you probably don't care that if other ones if they do and you're just along for the ride it's got that old English gothic kind of fun motion picture feel to it and most important you know it's quality production because simply put it's a hammer film I love the hammer film series all those if it's got Peter Cushing Christopher Lee if it, any of those kind of things I'm there I'm there without question I don't care what happens I know I'm gonna be in for something I like it's gonna be a little bit gothic it's gonna be a period piece it's gonna be well put together sometimes it might be a bit over the top sometimes they might be a little slow but either way I know I'm in for a quality production and any of the hammer flicks I've always been a fan of I've watched so many of them so many times over and over and over and over again to the 60s and the 70s I just I love that kind of stuff anyway if you want to have a good time watch something cool see something that was part of the Hammer family, see a bunch of good actors in a good motion picture. Again, it's not setting the world on fire, but for what it was, it was a really well done production. I think you can even find it free, like floating around YouTube and, or Amazon and all that kind of stuff. So just check it out, give it a look-see. You like it, you like it, yeah, you got nothing to lose if you don't. Give it a wing-ding. All right, people, catch you next time. See you later. God bless everybody. Be safe. Bye.